How is it to run an international upstream company out of Kuwait? What are the main priorities when developing their portfolio? And which projects makes him, as CEO, most proud? We have asked Sheikh Nawaf S. Al Saba, President and CEO KPI and Acting CEO of Kufbeck, to share his thoughts. Welcome to ONS Digital, Sheikh Nawaf Al Saba. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. It's a great pleasure to have you with us on this ONS first digital version. My pleasure. You ONS is a is a strong program, and we're very happy to be part of it, uh, whether it's uh, physically or digitally. Great. Uh, you and me, we are here to discuss how it is actually to run an international upstream company out of Kuwait, and uh, you're in in charge of that, and you're also running the international uh, downstream portfolio from KPI and your um, marketing business. But yes. could you explain to me what have it, has been your main focus over the last year when you actively developed an international portfolio? What have it, has been your main priorities? Sure. Uh, Kufbeck has been around since 1981, and we, uh, as, as has KPI, uh, since with the early 1980s. So we have a number of years, about 40 years of experience on the international stage. Uh, it's only recently that we have joined uh, other companies in uh, in Norway. So uh, we entered Norway a number of years ago, about 2013, but really through a number of acquisitions in 2015-16, where we uh, expanded our presence in, in Norway. But internationally, we have been working internationally. Part of our mandate as, as uh, a company owned by KPC, Kuwait Petroleum Corporation, the, the international uh, uh, the company, the national oil company of Kuwait, uh, is that uh, we have synergies with uh, our parent company, KPC, uh, whether it's through uh, internationally from Kufpec side, uh, being in projects that have uh, uh, technological or, uh, or other types of synergies uh, with the hydrocarbon business, the upstream business here in Kuwait, uh, or on the downstream side as well, it is uh, whether we can take, as we like to say, uh, oil from Kuwait, from the wellhead all the way to uh, the service station in Europe or the wingtip of the aircraft uh, internationally. So we have the whole downstream perspective uh, covered on the international side. But uh, working it out of Kuwait is actually a, a great place to be because I have uh, within uh, my backyard here in Kuwait, uh, about uh, 20,000 uh, people within the KPC system who are willing, able, and 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 uh, and very much specialized to help in uh, solving problems that I'm facing on the international side. Hmm. So it is it's it's a uh, it's a way of bringing in the two businesses, internationally and domestic, uh, together to provide value for the uh, hydrocarbons business in Kuwait and also uh, help our partners around the world. You, you mentioned Norway and UK, and you've been there for several years, as you say. Could you elaborate a little bit more on why are these interesting business areas? You talk about synergies, bringing back to technology. Could you elaborate a little bit? Well, there are a number of reasons. Uh, Norway is a fantastic place to work. Uh, the professionalism of the people that, uh, with whom we work is top notch, it's second to none. Uh, the access to acreage uh, that the uh, Norwegian government uh, puts forward is also very attractive. The fiscal terms as well are, are inviting. Um, Norway encourages companies to explore for hydrocarbons and uh, that is that is something very attractive to us, and it's and it's something that draws us uh, to to work in Norway. Um, and also, it's the technology uh, that we are deploying through our joint venture partnerships in uh, in Norway uh, that we can share with uh, with our upstream companies in Kuwait, and also bring in the uh, knowledge and practices that we have in Kuwait and share them with our partners in Norway. As you know. Uh, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund is uh, now, I think, the largest uh, sovereign wealth fund in the world. But it was modeled, I think, starting in the 1970s. It was modeled on the Kuwaiti Sovereign Wealth Fund, which started in 1953. So that we have a lot of shared history uh, between the two countries. And we're doing that as well on the uh, on the oil front. Hmm. That That's interesting. You mentioned that 
bringing technological competence. I know you have interesting portfolios going kind of in Kuwait offshore. Could you say what do you think that Norwegian offshore competence can be brought back to, to Kuwait? What are what what are your um, main interests? Sure, it's a very different offshore uh, business here in Kuwait con compared to Norway. Norway's uh, offshore is much deeper, uh, much harsher environment. You have weather uh, issues uh, uh, much more so than we face here. Our weather issues here mostly tend to be about the heat. It's about 50 degrees outside right now in mm -hmm. Kuwait. So it's not really a, an environment that you uh, want to work in in the middle of the day. But uh, the offshore here in Kuwait, I usually call it, a, you know, a, a very wet offshore is uh, onshore that it is just uh, uh, a few meters deep. It's not very. Uh, it's nowhere near the the uh, the, the depths of uh, the Norwegian continental shelf or the North Sea. And what we face here are uh, you're, you're purely in jackup territory, so you have to use mm -hmm. even smaller jackups. But there are issues with working offshore that are uh, the same everywhere around the world. So. We have been producing in Kuwait oil for over 80 years. Almost all of it has been onshore. Uh, it's been relatively easy production onshore. Now, as we look to expand production here in Kuwait, we're looking to the offshore. We're starting to, to drill uh, offshore. And this is where our sister company here in Kuwait, Kuwait Oil Company, has looked to us for, uh, uh, for help in completing the picture uh, for them on how to uh, develop an offshore uh, oil field. And we've been very privileged to help them and using our abilities around the world in Norway and in other places uh, around the world where we work offshore. So yes, there's a lot to be shared and we, and we have our engineers work back and forth uh, between our projects to, uh, to help each other out. That's interesting. And I know that there's a Norwegian uh, supply industry that is, in, uh, is uh, very eager to hear the, the things that you're saying right now. But moving yeah. back to projects, uh, you, you've yeah. all around the world, you have project, you have production on your own or together with other companies. Are there any specific, specific projects that you are extra proud of, technically, commercially or other elements? Sure. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of I would say, you know, if, if, if you have a family and, and these are your children, you're all you're really proud of all of them. But uh, <laughs> there are a number that, that, that do come out. Uh, and, and one of them is is one that we are very, very interested in, in, in applying here in Kuwait, and that is uh, power from shore. And that's what we're doing now in uh, Gina Krog uh, mm -hmm. with our uh, partners there. Uh, it's I think it was the first one in 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 uh, uh, in Norway. Uh, to bring power from shore, uh, and that is very interesting for us in Kuwait as we as we move offshore. As I said, uh, we were also uh, very proud of a, of, of uh, an LNG project that we're uh, we've been in in uh, in Australia. That's at uh, the Wheatstone uh, LNG. That is a project where we've been in since the the exploration side, and we've developed it. Uh, found uh, huge quantities of of uh, gas. Uh, right now, that gas, the LNG, is sold to our customers mostly in Japan. Uh, but we do have the ability to take volumes of LNG uh, from the Wheatstone facility, divert them uh, if we need to, uh, to Kuwait for uh, uh, for power generation needs. As you know, Kuwait is is uh, hydrocarbons rich, very oil rich, uh, but somewhat gas constrained during the during at least the the next few years as we develop our domestic gas resources. Uh, so we are importing LNG in, in relatively large quantities, and it would be nice to have equity LNG that is Kufbeck LNG, molecules that are Kufbecks, uh, end up uh, coming to Kuwait, whether they come as physical molecules from Wheatstone or they're traded in a way where uh, we get something uh, or swapped, in other words, uh, where we get closer uh, molecules coming into to Kuwait. But in the end, it is Kufbeck owned molecules and that would be uh, very complementary to the uh, to the oil business uh, here in Kuwait. So that's another project of which I'm proud. Mm -hmm. uh, a third one we're working uh, very closely with a partner uh, in uh, in Canada on shale uh, gas and condensate. Uh, I know it's it's a big discussion internationally about shale and where we're going with uh, with shale uh, in terms of the new price environments. 
but that is a project that is still continuing to to drill. Uh, we are uh, uh, increasing our production there. Uh, the gas is more or less a byproduct, essentially, of the condensate production. The condensate continues to fetch a good price, uh, and and that as a as an investment is very good for us. But more importantly, uh, it's it it is a learning curve for us because we have never. Uh, worked in a uh, in an unconventional facility, uh, an unconventional field of that type, and as we look here in Kuwait for the future, uh, as I said, we've been producing for 80 years, uh, but all of that has been uh, primary, secondary production. But mm. as we look, we've been drilling right through uh, vast quantities of uh, shale resources here in Kuwait and never have uh, exploited them. Uh, in the future, we will uh, we will need to do that. We will need to exploit the shale resources, of which uh, there is plenty in Kuwait. And having the the experience within Kufek of working in a uh, uh, in a shale uh, gas and condensate field uh, in, around the world in Canada, for example, uh, mm -hmm. is of an immense importance as we transfer that learning, that knowledge uh, to Kuwait to allow us to. Uh, uh, to develop our own shale resources. Hmm. So those are very quickly three projects of, uh, that have their own technical uh, and 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 uh, business uh, rationales. There are certainly other projects, uh, and I don't want to, uh, to to miss all of those. But uh, those are three that strike me because also they they allow us to embed uh, Kuwaiti engineers coming out of Kuwait into uh, the jo joint ventures where we're working with our partners so that uh, they can trade uh, information, knowledge, and uh, and learnings back and forth. You mentioned the Australian energy and uh, um, kind of interest for also going into the Asian market of selling energy, and we'll come back to that. But just first go back to Gina Krog and just power for sure. There's a, there's a huge pressure on delivering kind of low carbon solutions and reduce the environmental footprint of the oil and gas industry. How do you work to actively, actively meet those ambitions? You're right. Uh, the barrel of the future will not only be the lowest cost barrel, it'll be also the barrel with the lowest environmental cost. And this is what differentiates now uh, Kuwait and certainly the Gulf countries from other places around the world that are producing is that not only are, is our production almost all onshore and relatively cheap to produce, we're talking about uh, you know, a handful of, uh, of dollars per barrel uh, of, of production cost, uh, but add on top of that uh, the environmental cost, where the, the, the CO2 co uh, carbon cost of, of production, we are still also on the low end of that curve. Uh, we are uh, the cheapest barrel to produce internationally uh, for, from an economic and an environmental point of view. And that will differentiate us in the future. So as we look to where oil production will come in the world, it's going to come from uh, from these types of, uh, of regions that, that both have an economic and an environmental uh, uh, cost advantage uh, over others. And that's where we say uh, the last barrel of oil on earth will be produced from this region. It's for those two reasons. It used to be just for the economic reasons, but now as we look at it also from the uh, from the environmental point of view. Now, what are we doing to preserve that environmental cost advantage and, and in fact reduce the carbon cost of production even below where we are now at, at a world leading uh, uh, level? Uh, a lot of what we're looking at right now is on how to capture the carbon uh, at the wellhead, at the production uh, facility, uh, and then uh, use that to sequester. And, 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 and ultimately, the, the key is to use that also for uh, uh, maintenance of, of uh, reservoir uh, uh, pressures uh, to enhance production through, mm. uh, uh, through uh, injection of the, the, the carbon into, uh, into reservoirs, as we now do through gas now, technology is technically there the cost is quite high it's not as efficient as gas injection but in uh, if we are able to develop technology that will allow carbon injection uh, to replace essentially gas and, and, and water floods uh, then you solve two uh, two problems with one uh, with one action and that's something that all of us as humanity should be working towards uh, to uh, uh, to maintain 
what we all recognize is a requirement internationally that hydrocarbons will continue to be a principal transportation fuel. They may be a smaller portion of the hydrocarbons mix, but nevertheless, they will be an integral part of the transportation uh, uh, sector. Uh, but how do we reduce the carbon footprint of that uh, uh, of that production? And that's essentially what we're working on. I hear you saying so the market wants low cost barrels and it wants the low carbon barrels. Um, yes. And one and moving to the market side of it, uh, the Asian markets are probably the most uh, quickly developing and and. Um, the markets have tendered to, to the tables have been turning to, to Asian markets over the last years, US being uh, uh, self-sufficient on uh, energy. Could you explain to us how you see this uh, development from a Middle East point of view? Sure. Uh, traditionally from Kuwait, our uh, strongest markets have been the Asian markets. Uh, the netbacks uh, for barrels that we sell to the East are usually higher than those that we sell elsewhere around the world uh, because of a strong customer base that we have uh, that we've developed uh, for quite some time. For example, uh, the first international office that KPC, Koi Petroleum Corporation, had uh, outside Kuwait was in Tokyo and it was in 1950 something, I don't remember exactly year, but it was the 1950s. Interestingly enough, Kuwait's independence was in the 1960s so it was it was uh, a number of years before kuwait even reached its uh, its independence that we had a marketing office in tokyo selling uh, kuwait export crude uh so the the, the re historical relationship that we have with countries uh, in, in the east has been um, going back for multiples of decades uh as we continue and and, and grow that uh, certainly China, India have been the, the big growth stories over the past few years. And our relationship with China, with, uh, uh, with our friends in China has been, uh, uh, stronger than ever. And we're part and, and proud to be part of the growth story in China over the past, uh, few decades, uh, as one of the principal, uh, suppliers of crude into, into China, uh, on the, uh, uh, in the rest of uh, uh, of Asia as well, uh, as we look at now where we are with COVID and the impacts of the coronavirus uh, pandemic on uh, where we're going in the future, uh, we see obviously the impact has been everywhere, but uh, on the Asian side, uh, we see that the demand is recovering better than, than in other places, uh, or maybe faster than in other places. Uh, it, may have something to do with uh, with how uh, Asian countries have responded to the coronavirus uh, in a very effective way and uh, for the most part have have limited its its uh, its impact um, we see uh, the, the the future really being there as and, and as we expand our relationship with uh, uh, with uh, whether it's Southeast Asia or or any other or other places through the continent, mm -hmm. uh, it's some place where we're positioning ourselves. Whether it's on uh, from the KPC side or also from the Kufpec side, uh, for be, being in in projects in uh, uh, in a number of the Asian countries, mm -hmm. it's it's uh, it's it. We think it is the place to be for the future. On the mm -hmm. downstream side, I should add as well, because I, I know a lot of times that we, we talk at ONS, we, we, we tend to concentrate on the upstream. But mm -hmm. uh, as you mentioned, I, I, I do have the downstream, international downstream business as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we're proud to be a, uh, uh, a joint venture partner in a refinery in Vietnam, uh, for example, mm -hmm. uh, that runs exclusively on Kuwait export crude. So it's 200,000 mm -hmm. barrels of oil uh, a day that is refined in, in a refinery in, in Vietnam. Um, where we own 35%, and uh, the refinery runs uh, exclusively uh, Kuwaiti crude, and we produce uh, the products that are produced are almost exclusively used within the uh, Vietnamese market. It's a very gra uh, very fast growing market, mm -hmm. and uh, we provide about 40% of the uh, uh, refined fuel uh, uh, products of, of uh, Vietnam. So. We're we're very uh, uh, we're very happy to to expand our presence in uh, in Asia uh, on the downstream side as well. 
I'm glad to hear that you're well positioning to take uh, also f f further growth in the Asian markets. I just want to dwell a little bit on the COVID-19. I mean, we over the last couple of months, it's been a difficult situation. And I assume it's been that in Kuwait too. And both the, the prices have been plunging and now back to acceptable level at least. But which kind of long-term effects do, do you see coming out of the situation that we have been and have been into and, and still are actually? There are undoubtedly long-term effects uh, from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, uh, we very quickly uh, took a number of steps when this happened, uh, when, when we saw uh, the, uh, the pandemic happening. Uh, first and foremost, uh, as every business uh, would do, we took care of our people. We made sure our people were healthy, are safe, uh, and also the communities in which we operate. Uh, we wanted to make sure uh, that we are an active and, and uh, supportive participant of the communities where we operate. Uh, next, we took steps to, uh, to structure the business so that we can uh, withstand what we could all see being an extremely uh, volatile, but mostly negative uh, number of months coming uh, forward. So uh, I, I'm taking a look now as uh, comparing how we reacted uh, during this COVID crisis to how we reacted uh, when uh, oil prices uh, crashed after 2014 uh, uh, into 2015 and 16 and so mm. on and so forth. Um, right now, uh, the crash has been uh, much steeper. Uh, obviously, it hasn't, uh, uh, we haven't gone on as long as the 2015-16 uh, crisis, but, uh, but we do see obviously uh, the, the effects of COVID continuing on for some time. Uh, thankfully, up, up to now, uh, COFPEC has fared relatively well. We've fared much better than our peers. In fact, I just uh, looked at our uh, uh, July numbers and we, were, uh, and, and we had a almost $30 million profit in, in, in July, uh, which, is all, which is very good for uh, the midst of a pandemic. How do we uh, uh, translate that for uh, the future compared to what, what we did in the last time, we're doing much better. But it's still, uh, there's still a lot to be done. We've, uh, uh, we've taken a step in our strategy right now where we, set, where we go back to the name of Kufpec. Kufpec is the Kuwait Foreign Petroleum Exploration Company. Mm -hmm. And quite a number of our new projects had been production or, or, or development projects over the past few years. Uh, but about a year ago, about a couple of years ago, we concentrated quite a bit more on the exploration side. After all, it's part of the name of the company. It's mm -hmm. on the outside uh, door of the, of the building. It's on the top of the building. So we do want to concentrate quite a bit more on exploration. And we're seeing the, the effects of that showing. So last year, for example, we had a multi-TCF uh, discovery of gas in, uh, in Malaysia. Uh, this year, we announced a uh, sizable uh, oil discovery in Egypt. And as we look now to operate more exploration projects around the world, uh, we hope that we can take advantage of what other companies are doing. The, uh, other companies are retrenching quite a bit from exploration and, 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 mm. and sanctioning new projects. Uh, and we think that will uh, create a uh, supply crunch in the future as the world economy pulls out of uh, COVID-19, uh, demand picks up. Uh, if supply is not there, uh, there will be a, uh, a, a greater volatility in the oil price as it, as it increases. And we want to be positioned through our exploration activities to have those new barrels available and supply a market uh, that we think will be tighter in a few years' time. Uh, Will there be any lasting effects of COVID? I think probably there will be. Uh, people have now become more accustomed to working from home, uh, working remotely. ONS is being done uh, virtually. Uh, there's no replacement for, for being in Stavanger, I can tell you that, but still this is uh, still uh, better than nothing at all. And as that happens, people we think may uh, change their habits, but we don't think it'll be fundamentally altered. Uh, that uh, hopefully, once a uh, a vaccine or a cure is 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 uh, is found, I think the econ world economy will come back relatively quickly. 
there's no there's no substitute for face to face interactions with people, and that is uh, that's going to push up the transportation sector, uh, and we think in any way you look at it, any way you cut it, yes, there will be greater uh, uh, electric uh, penetration, electric vehicle penetration into the uh, into the vehicle fleet, but it'll not completely displace the uh, 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 the internal combustion engine. The ICE will be more more efficient, and we need it to be more efficient because of the population growth and economic growth. We still think that uh, oil pri- oil uh, demand will uh, will continue to hover around the hundred million. Mm-hmm. Uh, barrel a day mark for quite some time. And we have to continue to drill. We have to continue to explore for oil to replace the natural declines that happen over time. And this is where Kofpec is positioning itself uh, so that we can take advantage of that. And then they, the state of Kuwait is doing that as well uh, mm-hmm. through uh, through incre- uh, uh, increasing our production capacity here in Kuwait. I think it's perfect to end this talk with the words of hope, uh, words of hope yes. of uh, of finding a vaccine, but also a hope of uh, doing more exploration, finding more. There's a Norwegian saying, if you don't go looking, you will not find. And I'm glad to hear that you will look, and I hope you will do that in Norway as well. Thank you very yeah. much, Sheikh Nawaf al Zaba. It's been a great pleasure to have you with us, and I look forward to seeing you in Stavanger in 2022. Thank as we you. say, in, as we say, inshallah, we'll uh, we'll we'll see you in a couple of years' time in uh, in Savanger and uh, and all of our uh, partners and friends there. And love to go hiking up uh, to uh, Prikestolen or anywhere else, uh, and, uh, as we always do when we when we come to uh, to Norway. Thank the you. world is welcome. Thank you. <laughs>